Hello! Welcome to Adapter Parish, episode 17. Now, before we get to today's episode of The Price of Salt slash Carol, we'll get into what that's about in a few minutes. I want to give a couple of quick updates, and I want to talk about our next episode. First, in the continuing West Wing kind of bi-weekly, but only in the intro, uh, I have now finished season two. I am a couple of episodes into season three. I am deeply sad about that thing that happened. Um, it still just sits with me. I had to put the show aside for a couple of days after it happened. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, but that's where I'm at, and I'm still really enjoying it. As far as an update goes, we did get a piece of listener mail. This gave us a little more insight into the Giver series that we talked about in our last episode. So we kind of referred to the other books in the series as sequels, uh, apparently they're really more companion books because there's Gathering Blue and The Messenger. Those are really companion books. They take place in the same world. And then there's the fourth book in the series, Sun. That one wraps all three together with characters from the previous three books. This came from someone who is a retired middle school librarian. So I think safe to say our kind of core demographic. Now, moving on, let's talk about our next episode. For those of you that know the description of our show, this is one we're really excited about because it goes back to kind of the, the core inception of the show. Because if you look at our description, we say we talk about a lot of different things, books to movies, comic books to movies, but we also talk about movies to musicals and then back to movie musicals. Well, we're finally doing that one. We're going to be covering, in our next episode, Mel Brooks, The Producers. This is one of my favorites. It's one that we love. And it was a lot of fun to make. That brings us to this episode. Patricia Highsmith's The Price of Salt, which became the 2015 movie, Carol. Hello and welcome to Adapt or Perish, a podcast about adaptation. My name is Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. We're very happy to have everybody here with us this week. Hello. I think I say that every time, but yeah, we're always happy about it. we're always it. happy, so it's always true. Yeah. So do you want to get right into it? Yes. I'm super excited about this one. Do you want to tell everyone what we're talking about? Yes. All right. Okay. Um. Well, they already know because they saw it in the title, but they might not know because maybe they're confused about the title of the book. What is that? So... Um, today we are going to be talking about a 1952 book that was adapted into a 2015 Oscar nominated movie. And the name of the book is different from the name of the movie. Except for when it wasn't. Right. What do you mean? <laughs> We're going to get into it. What was the original name of the book? The sweetie? original name of the book is The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. Uh, excuse me? Patricia Highsmith. That's no, that's that is not the case. The original book was entitled The Price of Salt. Yes. By Claire Morgan. Because <gasps> she wrote it under a pseudonym. She wrote it under a yes. A pseudonym. I don't know why I was repeating you. I don't know why you were either. That's really <laughs> strange. Do you know that I didn't when the movie Clue was the first time I ever heard the word pseudonym and I understood what it meant in context, but I thought what he was saying, because it was Tim Curry, I thought he was saying suitor name. And I don't know why I thought that. Anyway, that's... A suitor name. It's a name you take on yeah. when you don't want people to know your real name. That's what I always thought it was. So you accurately knew the definition of pseudonym. Well, it was clear from context what it meant. I just didn't understand what the word was. Anyway, this book was written by an author. In 1952, it was published called The Price of Salt. And it was made into a movie in 2015 starring Kate Blanchett yep. and Rooney Mara mm -hmm. and um, a number of other people including uh, Sarah Paulson, and the name of that movie was Carol, which is the name of one of the characters in the book. And it's also what the book was republished as. That's right. In the 90s. That's right. Is that true? Oh, in the 90s? I thought, I see, I knew it was republished as Carol, but I thought that was because of the movie. No. Oh, very interesting. Yes. Okay, well, I guess then I can't kind of call out the movie for being a jerk and changing the title, because I like the title. I like The Price of Salt. I think that's a cool title. Apparently, Highsmith liked Carol as a title. Oh. Yeah. I wonder why Why do you think it was changed? Do you know? Well. Are we going to get start getting into your research here? I, I think I didn't want to get to this segment as early as we are oh. right now, but it's time for me to make a wild assumption. Oh, God. <laughs> we can 
delay it if you want. No, let's let's jump right to wild assumption time. Go ahead. Uh, my wild assumption, uh, it was based on a few things that I have read. Okay. Which is that I think there was an assumption on the part of publishers and those involved mm-hmm. that The Price of Salt as a title was a little hard for people to kind of uh, connect with. Mm-hmm. And that Carol being the name of one of the main characters yes. was something that was a little easier for people to grasp. I see. Does that sound does that sound like a wild assumption or just a mild assumption? It sounds like a mild assumption, but here's one better and I don't know if you came across this in your research, mm-hmm. but apparently um there was a screenplay going around in earlier, I don't know what time period, like 80s or 90s of this book The Price of Salt, but it wasn't called Carol, it was called Carl. Because they changed Carol to a man. I didn't see anything about that. So this was nothing prior to the 2015 Oscar nominated Carol. There was that Carl. A, is that a thing though? I read it on Autostraddle. Did you? Yes, I did. I don't know why I said that. Like, I doubt that you read it. I believe that Everything you read it. Everything on Autostraddle is about Carol. So if I read it, that's where I got it from. Okay. Yeah. That sounds... Uh... I feel like we've brought up a couple of segments that we're going to wait. We were going to sort of wait until later. Let's talk about the plot of this book. Okay. All right. Well, in order to do that, I think we have to go to our, 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 our new recurring segment, Back of the Box. In this case, Back of the Book. So I have here... Um, I don't know if you can hear it. I'm going to make a noise. I have here a book. Uh, this is the... You're uh, like a magician. Yes. This is a the Dover edition of the book The Price of Salt by Patricia Highsmith. And uh, under genre, I mean, this maybe gives it away, but under genre at the top, it says fiction slash lesbian, I don't, which I think know, is a little narrow-minded. I, no, I think that's really good. I think I would have been more bothered if it was lesbian slash fiction. Yeah. I like lesbian slash fiction. Oh, but I'm bump. There it is. I'm, re- I'm a little annoyed that I didn't know I was setting you up for that. <laughs> My dad listens to this. And here we are. He's going to have a lot of questions. <laughs> Does your dad know what slash fiction is? Well, I did explain it on a previous episode. I don't know. Maybe he didn't hear that one. Do you think he retained that? No. Well, we're going to have a fun conversation at some point. Great. Um, okay. So. Do you want to read the back of the book? Yes, I do. Um, I'm going to read the first paragraph here. A chance encounter between two lonely women leads to a passionate romance in this lesbian cult classic. Therese, a struggling young sales clerk, and Carol, a homemaker in the midst of a bitter divorce, abandon their oppressive daily routines for the freedom of the open road where their love can blossom. But their newly discovered bliss is shattered when Carol is forced to choose between her child and her lover. And then there's sort of another paragraph about the way that the book was uh, received, which we can talk about that's later. That's our job to talk about. That's right. That's right. Um, so that's so, what it's about. So do you, do you, well, first of all, you read this book. Yeah. Um, and you saw the movie, but yes, let's um. just talk about, start with the book. Yes. Um. Do you think that is an accurate um, summary of the book? Do you think it got the, I mean, certainly like plot wise, it's pretty accurate, but do you think it got like sort of the, the tone of the book? Right. I think there is a fundamental aspect of the back of the book that is absent, Mm -hmm. uh, which is that Therese is the main character. Yes, that's correct. Carol is the object of her affection. Yes. But Therese is the main character. Yes. The book is written from her perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would say 90% of the book is her. Yeah. And Carol is... A very, very potent 10%. Are you saying it kind of makes it sound like Thelma and Louise? <laughs> little bit. Little bit. It's, yeah, the the fact that they go on a road trip, I actually don't think is as major a plot point. I don't think it's major for their story that it was a road trip. The road trip, and, and also the road trip is much less of the book than yeah. you would think from seeing the movie. But let me, do you mind if I give a, try to expand on that a little no, bit? No, go ahead, please. So, Therese Bellavet is a young woman living in New York City Mm -hmm. in the early 50s. She uh, works in a department store as a temp during the holidays, but that's not what she wants to do. What she wants to do is she wants to be a set designer for theater. That's right. Yeah, for Broadway. Mm -hmm. For Broadway. For Broadway and anything she can get. Broadway and below. Yeah. So that's Therese. Mm -hmm. Would you like to set up the other character? I would. So Carol Aird, Mrs. Hargis Aird, is a woman who is about 30 or 32, described so-called in the book. Uh, Therese is about 19. And she encounters Therese when she goes to um, the 
department store to buy a Christmas gift for her little daughter. She's got like a five, six-year-old daughter. And Therese is immediately sort of enchanted or enraptured by her. They have a very sort of short conversation. And Therese takes it upon herself to go and send Carol a Christmas card. Now, if you've seen the movie, it's a little bit different, but this is the book. Uh, and Carol calls her on the telephone at the store and asks her out on a lunch date. A glove lunch. A glove lunch. <laughs> Except in the book, there's no gloves. There's no gloves at all. No gloves whatsoever. I'll, li- I'll link to glove lunch. Yeah. Um, and they meet. They have an encounter. Um, and suddenly they're kind of thrust together Um Therese goes to her house. She meets her husband. She meets her child. And Carol is having a really hard time at home because she's going through a divorce. And they go on a road trip together. Just gals being pals. And that's the but end whole, of the book. But a whole bunch of stuff happens before the road trip. Yeah. Their their relationship, it, it, if it wasn't for the fact that Therese is so clearly infatuated with Carol. Yes. It would seem like they were becoming friends. Gals being pals. But that's not what it is. No, they're it's, in love. It's very clear that that's not what they're, it is. They're in sex love. And a whole bunch of things happen. Yes. We find that we meet other characters. Mm-hmm. There's, for example, Therese's boyfriend. Richard. Who is great mm-hmm. for the first page. <laughs> and then he becomes He's, rapidly ungreat. He becomes the worst. He is the worst. There is Carol's friend. Uh, Abby. Abby, um, who is uh, used to be a a uh, quote unquote friend, and now is just a friend. Yeah. Um, and she used to be a special friend, but now she's just a friend. Right. She was a friend, then she was a special friend, then she was a friend again. Yes. Um, there's Carol's ex husband and uh, their daughter. Mm-hmm. He is also kind of the worst. Yeah. All of the men in this book are the worst. Did you feel that way? Is there any man in this book that's not the worst? I'm like searching for one, not because I feel like I owe it to my gender <laughs> to find one. I'm just curious if I can think of one. No, I can't think of any. Cool. Well, so here we are. Yes, men are the worst. Yep. Period. End of podcast. Sure. Done. I love you. I love you too. Great. I'm fine. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, a, man, and... a man directed the movie. Yeah, he did. Well, you're going to talk about that later. Um... And so they have this sort of torturous affair, Therese and Carol. Mm-hmm. And the book ends with them both alive and presumably going to continue their relationship. Now, why is that important? Why would you make a point of saying that they are both alive and will continue their relationship? Very good question. And we're going to talk about uh, lesbian pulp fiction for a minute here. Let's do it. Um, so there is a, there is a sort of literary tradition which then turned into the modern trope if you go to tvtropes.com i think it's called kill all your gays or bury your gays whatever it is we'll definitely link to it yeah um which is basically like the gay character in everything always dies particularly if they were happy (laughs) (laughs) they get punished they get punished um and So I think, and that is still true, like, up even until this day. Autostrada actually did, like, a list of, like, the top hundred dead gay characters. Now, I'm going to stop you for one second. Yeah. Let's say, hypothetically, that I was not intimately familiar with Autostraddle. Yeah. Let's say one of our listeners wasn't super familiar with it. Would you like to just give me a quick once over on Um, Autostraddle? Autostraddle is a uh, news and discussion website for queer women and they are they love Carol very much. Yeah, of course I know what that is. Yes. I know all about Autostraddle. Yes. But let's say someone didn't. Yes. So if anybody wants to read more articles about Carol than you can shake a stick at, uh, I highly recommend autostraddle.com. It's a wonderful website, especially if you are a queer women queer who that's hard to say it's a wonderful website especially if you are a queer woman. That was beautiful. That is who it's for. Yeah. So this book is really revolutionary in where it sits in history because it was published in 1952 and yet the two women like fall in love have an explicitly sexual relationship which is discussed and described in the book they both end up alive 
unpunished. And at the end of the book, the, the implication is that they are going to be together, that, that they, they have decided to have a relationship with each other. And that's how the book ends. It has a happy ending. And that is still really rare even today. Never mind in 1952. Yeah. So I think when we talk about this, especially when we talk about like sort of the audience response to the movie, a lot of what we're talking about is people who have not seen themselves represented on screen positively having a movie that they can just go and watch without all of this other stuff that comes along with it um kind of similar to when i went to see uh ghostbusters in the theater the I new will ghostbusters say. the lady ghostbusters yeah um it's just really really refreshing to see yourself on screen and not have to worry that you are going to be badly treated if that makes sense if, if you identify with a character oh wait you're asking me if it makes sense to go see something where i am represented on screen well yeah i am very familiar with that <laughs> Um, but maybe you don't think about it as much. Oh, no, I sure don't. Yeah. Take it for granted right over here. Yeah. Um, it's great. Yeah. I, yeah, babe. I, I, I don't, I, I envy you. And I'm, well, no, I'm glad that now, especially after Lady Ghostbusters came out, your experience is the same as mine. With, every, know, with every movie. You yeah. now know what it's like. Except for just that one movie. That yeah. was it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I will say one thing about this. Yeah, go for it. I was not as aware of all of this. No, you were not. This was something you put on the list. We yes. each have we have our list of the episodes that we're going to do. And there are some that we definitely talk about together. And we say, oh, we should do that thing. And we both are in complete agreement. Yeah. But then there are several where it's, oh, I want this on the list. Yes. It is important to me that this is on the list. Yes. I've had some of those. You've had some of those. That's right. This is one of yours. That's right. I didn't really know this that well. Mm -hmm. I, had never, I had never seen Carol. I was aware of it when it came out. I was not aware of how people reacted to it. Mm -hmm. I certainly didn't know about The Price of Salt. Yes. But now here I sit, having yes. read it and having watched the movie. It and right before we watched the movie, it was like you turned... I want to tell a story really quickly. Go ahead. Go ahead. We've been watching all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies. Yes. I like superheroes a lot. Yeah. You have not really seen many of them. No. And well, any, I have now. Yeah, any that you've seen have been because of our relationship. That's right. Would you agree to that? Uh, do the X-Men movies count? Theirs are separate. Then no. Yes. Then yes. Okay. So, any superhero movies you've seen have either been because of me or your other boyfriend, Sir Patrick Stewart. That's correct, yes. Okay. When we were going back and watching some of the earlier Marvel movies, right before I turn on Iron Man 2, I'm literally hitting play and I turn to you and I say really quickly, uh, by the way, this one is widely regarded as the worst Marvel movie. Here we go! Yep. And you, that you did that. Yep. When we watched Carol... It maybe didn't happen exactly that way, but I feel like you said, by the way, this movie is incredibly important to a large swath of population, a huge population of gay people yes. and queer people. Mostly lesbians. And suddenly I'm like, oh, geez, I got to be thinking about this on many levels and I got to be really careful. I This episode scares the shit out of me. I do not want to inadvertently shit on something. Yes. That people love. Yeah. I was not aware about how much this meant to people. Yes, it does mean a lot to people. So I'm very nervous. Okay, well. Just to get it out there. Great. Well, you have me. I will guide you through this. I appreciate I that. I will help you along the way. She's holding my hand right now. I love you. It's really cute. I'm not holding his hand. I can't reach him. So let's keep talking about the book a little okay, bit. Okay, great. Um, I really so, liked it, by the way. Uh, I really liked it. Not only did I really like it, but after we had watched the movie, which I had seen, um, but I've now seen twice, um, I went back and looked at the book again to try to just re-familiarize re myself so that we could talk about kind of the book and the movie as separate things. And there's a lot in the book that didn't make it into the movie. And some of those th are things that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Is this a good time to do that? I think we should jump right into it. Okay, yeah. great. Um, because there's a lot that's really symbolic that's more about Therese. Carol in the movie is so magnetic, and also she's Kate Blanchett, that the movie almost cannot help but be about Wait, her. You're saying the movie stars famously pretty person Kate Blanchett? It does indeed, yes. Oh, yes. I really like famously pretty person Kate Blanchett. Great. What I'm saying is that it, the movie like cannot help but be about her because it's a very magnetic human being playing a very magnetic character. Is that is that fair to say that? Yes. Um, but the book, there's all it's mostly about, like you were saying before, it's mostly about Therese. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I want to talk about Therese for a minute. Let's do that. Um, she is about 19. She wants to be a uh, like you said before, a set designer. She really doesn't have any family 
Um, and this isn't really touched on like in the book in the movie she's clearly like a lonely person um she doesn't seem like she has a lot of community or support structure but in the book it's made explicit that she basically grew up in an orphanage like she had parents but her closest relationships were like with the nuns um and so she's a very just solitary introverted person um and one of the first things that we see in the book is this sort of odd scene where she meets this older woman at the department store. Now you're thinking, oh, yes, that's the scene where she meets Carol. No, no, no. A, an older woman, uh, an elderly woman um, in the cafeteria, also another worker there. And they end up just going back to this woman's house. And she's just like repelled and disgusted by her. But she also can't leave. It's this very odd scene and and when I was reading through it and and nothing like happens between them she just kind of like tells her about her life and then Therese fall, gives her a dress and then Therese falls asleep people are always giving Therese dresses in this book um <laughs> it was a different time it was a different time um and so I I was rereading this and I was thinking like what is what is the purpose of this of this scene and I think it's really just to show like how she kind of gets pulled around and molded by the people around her. That she just kind of is whatever that person needs and wants at any at any given time. And the, the fact that when she meets Carol, Carol is the first person that kind of just doesn't need her to be anything other than who she is. She doesn't need her to be anything other than present. That's right. And and so that that was what I took away from that. There's that it's just kind of a weird scene at the beginning of the book. And then she continues to think about her. She like writes her Miss, the, the character's name is Mrs. Robichak. And she like writes her postcards from the road and like sends her presents. And she's just very important to her. She becomes important to her as the book goes on. But I just it's it's really interesting because in the scene where they actually interact, there's a lot of talk about how Therese is just kind of disgusted by her and like she's repellent, but she's just kind of also strangely attracted by her, not to her necessarily. Um, and so Therese has a boyfriend and mm -hmm. we're going to talk about this too. Uh, you know, feel free to chime in. Um, no, you're doing a great job so far. So Therese has a boyfriend named Richard and Richard has a bunch of friends. So in the book and similar to the movie, um, he has these like kind of like avant-garde style friends that all kind of have day jobs as things that are things that they don't want to do. Um, and one of them says, oh, I can get to res a job as a set designer on some show. And Richard wants to go to Europe with her. Um, Richard is. In, can I talk about Richard yeah, for a second? Yeah, please do. So Richard is in love with Therese. Mm -hmm. He tells himself. Yes, I was about to say, in as much as he understands what that means. Yeah, he is also uh, a kind of a dumb kid. He mm -hmm. is in love with her in one of the most insidiously possessive ways that I think I've read okay. in, in a book like this. Please. Um, one of the things that I really love about the way Richard is presented, he is not presented as an antagonist mm -hmm. at the beginning. Yeah. At all. He's just Richard. If anything, it's a little sad that he's more into Therese than Therese is into him. Yeah. Over the course of the book, his character takes goes down such a path. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. You, the toxicity of Richard becomes more apparent, more and more apparent with every chapter that he's in. And of course, he is just the human representation of our favorite P word. Uh. Which P word? No, not that one. The patriarchy. Oh, patriarchy. Yes, patriarchy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. He is also a penis. Yes, he is. <laughs> Explicit tag. Um, no, Richard sucks. Yeah, Richard's, he sucks. He's a fucking worst. <laughs> but he doesn't start out as the worst. He always just kind of sucks, but yeah. then he gets terrible by the end of the book. Yeah, well... And that's one of the things I really like about the book, is the book doesn't present anybody... One way for the entire book. Yeah. You really get to know these characters. And I'm not going to say you're allowed to come to your own conclusions regarding them. Mm -hmm. Because the author clearly shows you what she wants to show you. Right. However, I never felt like Patricia Highsmith was telling me Richard was terrible. 
she was showing me that Richard was terrible. So I have a couple of examples from the beginning of the book mm-hmm. of Richard Richard being terrible, and I'd love it if you then had some examples from the end of the book of him, towards the end of the book of him being terrible. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, So one of the things that is kind of, again, like, showing not telling about how he's terrible is that he's trying to she she has a book that he had told her to read like her her light reading for her lunch break is um portrait of the artist as a young man yeah and there's like this one line that it's like richard said richard said he couldn't understand how someone who had read gertrude stein hadn't read james joyce and I just love that because it's of the oblivion- obliviousness of, oh, of course, I'm just reading Gertrude Stein for the literary merit. I needed to start with Joyce. I started I started like 1920s writers in the wrong place. Like, that's not why she was reading Gertrude Stein. Right. Um, that's not why I read Gertrude Stein when I was in high school. Um, for, the, for the literary merit, of course. Of course. Of course. Um, so another thing about Richard in the book We'll talk about the movie later. But in the book, he and Therese have slept together. It is explicitly mentioned yes. that they have had sex. And in fact, um, there's a little mention of a sex scene between them, which basically the Therese's reaction was in the middle of having sex to say to Richard, is this right? <laughs> which I think is so funny. Um, but basically... They have had sex. She didn't enjoy it. Like right. that is explicitly mentioned in the book, which I think is is fantastic. I, I feel like one argument that someone in the world of 1952 or even now might make to a very young woman who is interested in another woman might say to them s- stupidly, well, how do you know like that you like women because you haven't even had sex with a man but mm-hmm. this is like no i tried it i didn't like it yeah um so i almost feel like like not to get into patricia highsmith's head but i almost wonder if she put that in kind of for that reason um to sort of just defuse that argument right there um but something that i noticed again this is super subtle but when therese and carol go to lunch for the first time what we're going to call the glove lunch even though it wasn't the glove lunch in the book mm-hmm. they have quite a conversation Carol says to her, how do you, how do you like your name to be pronounced? Um, what, what, you know, what, what is that name from? What, what is it about? And she says, oh, I'm, I'm really happy you asked because I do say Therese. I don't say Teresa or, or Therese or Terry. Um, and as someone with an unusual name or e- indeed a name that could be pronounced multiple ways, I really do appreciate it when someone says, just just remind me, how do you pronounce your name? And I always say, thank you. It's Ariel. I respond to anything, but I really appreciate it when you take the time to ask me how to say it. Right. So I, I guess I, maybe I noticed that scene more. But I also noticed, and she, she specifically says, I like being called Therese. That's my name. Immediately after, there's a scene with Richard where he calls her Terry. Every yes. single sentence that he speaks to her, like like over the top in a way that you would never use someone else's name in a, in a conversation with them. And Patricia, Patricia Highsmith writes dialogue wonderfully. So I, I don't think this is her being bad at dialogue using the name so much. I think it's literally wanting to emphasize that he is calling her by a name that she does not care to be called and he never thought to ask what she prefers. Yeah, no, and, I'm, I'm shaking my head emphatically right yes. now because that's like that to me is where his character turns yeah. from being just kind of a doofus to being someone who is kind of toxic yeah 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 Yeah. um so those are my two early examples of sort of mild toxicity do you want to talk about stuff he does later in the book basically there is that midway point when therese and carol go on their road trip essentially while they're gone richard has this entire narrative that he's concocted in his head about the nature and end of his relationship with Therese. Mm-hmm. As far as she's concerned, they were never that serious. She was never in love with him. And now she's leaving to go do this with another person. So clearly their relationship is over. Yeah. If it ever existed. But it's not over for him. Because to him, they're engaged. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's not over for him until he says it's over. Right. So it's it's kind of this thing of like, you're not quitting. I'm firing you. Right. That kind of thing. And you get to find, you get these letters that he writes to her while she's on the road. And that to me was like the epitome of him being a really toxic person. Mm -hmm. 
because it's so clear that he has established this entire narrative in his head about how awful she is and about why he's happier and better off now that he's decided to dump her. Right. <laughs> Which is not even close to what reality is. Yeah, there's there's an advice columnist that I really love that probably our listeners, I wouldn't be surprised if we had a big overlap, but um, she's called Captain Awkward. Yeah. And one of the things she talks about a lot is a breakup is unilateral. You don't have to have mutual decision making you can break up with someone even if they don't want to break up with you yes and when you say we are not in a relationship the relationship is over both people do not have to come to a mutual understanding on that right and and i feel like he's he's the guy writing in saying like my girlfriend says we're broken up but like i really just need to talk to her about why like her decision was wrong you know what i mean totally totally so that that to me was the part of his character that rub that rubbed me the wrong way the most. Totally, he is a he's a dink the whole the <laughs> whole time. Dink. He's not even a dick. He's a dink. He's just a little. He's just a he's a fucking dildo. He's the worst. <laughs> hey, wait a second. He's the worst, and then just gets worse and worse as time goes on. Yeah, but I really like that because I like being confronted with my own appraisal of a character. Because at the beginning, I kind of looked at him as being kind of harmless. Yeah. And by the end of the book, I've realized that that was my interpretation and that was incorrect. A character like that is not harmless. A character like that can do a lot of harm to someone. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I feel like I haven't said this yet. Yeah, go I, ahead. I really liked this book. I think you did say it, but, you, you know, it bears repeating. I like it a lot. It's a really good book. I, I've said this a couple of times now. I actually said this specifically about The Handmaid's Tale. Mm -hmm. I said during The Handmaid's Tale, it was maybe the best point of view book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say this has supplanted it, but if I had to make a like a top five subjective books, because this isn't written from her point of view. Right. It's written in the third person. Yeah. But it is so subjective. It's so clearly written from the perspective of Therese. It's one of the best books I've ever read written that way. Yeah. I responded to that so much. The, there's the entire sections where she first meets Carol. I'm not the only person, I'm sure, who has become infatuated with someone at first sight. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've never had an author capture what that feels like more yeah. than Patricia Highsmith did in this book. Yeah. This book spoke to me. Yeah. And the fact that, that they were the fact that they were both women had nothing to do with what spoke to me. Right, right, right. I just appreciated that on a whole separate level. I, I liked this book a lot. I, I appreciate that, and I'm I'm glad that you liked it. And I I just like as you were talking, I was just thinking like, just the way that we uh, I'm gonna make you a stand-in for all men here for a moment. Is that I'll, okay? I'll be a straw man. Go for it. Great. I just feel like the way that we approach education and literacy does men a great disservice because I feel like the way that we grew up anyway is that girls were expected to read books about both boys and girls yeah and boys were only expected to read books about boys does, is, is that does that does that sync up with your sort of remembrance of what childhood was like because think of just the books we've read on the podcast that you had never read mm -hmm. Anne of Green Gables yep. Little Women Girls Book Pride and Prejudice Girls Book Handmaid's Tale Girls Book Price of Salt hadn't heard of it yeah <laughs> probably not appropriate for a grade schooler fair enough but you hear what Neither I'm saying the Handmaid's Tale now that I think about I'm it I'm just talking about men I'm talking male male people and female pe people people coded as male and coded as female yes. in, in society yes it just you you were never given the op no one ever told you to read these books. You know what I mean? When you were growing up, because they didn't think that that was something you would enjoy or be good at. Just like no one ever encouraged me to do computer science, which I'm still kind of bitter about. But you understand what you understand what I'm saying. No, here. I mean, the, the thing that you're making me think of right now is if someone said to me, can you name all of the books that you ever read when you were a kid that were about a man mm -hmm. or about a boy? Yeah, I wouldn't be able to list them. Right. There would be too many. Right. Right. But you're sitting here. But if you sat here and said, can you name all of the ones where a girl was the main character? Mm -hmm. I would say, oh, yeah, the girl who owned a city. Yeah. That's the reason that comes to my mind so quickly is because there were so few of them. Right. Did right. you ever read that one, by the way? No, I never read that. But I read tons of books about girls. It's, it's super good. But OK. But my point is that I read tons of books about girls. Yeah. It wasn't that books about girls didn't exist. It was that you as as a assigned male at birth human. Yep continuing to identify as male throughout your life yes um 
were not was not encouraged or requested to read those books and did not choose to read them. I think your thesis holds up. Great. Great. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Yeah. So just kind of getting back to it, bottom line, I really, really liked this book. I also I really enjoyed liked reading this, book. this so much. There's a couple other quick things I just want to say really quickly about how much I enjoyed it. Yeah. There are things I found out after reading it that suddenly made made my liking of it make so much more sense. Mm-hmm. Not so much about kind of the way it deals with love and infatuation, because mm-hmm. that spoke to me. But there's this whole mystery aspect to it. And not so much mystery, thriller. Mm-hmm. There really is an aspect of this book that's a thriller. I'm going to go ahead and admit my ignorance go ahead. going into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Patricia Highsmith was not a name that was on my radar. Mm-hmm. I didn't find out until afterwards, and we could have mentioned this at the beginning. Yeah, we didn't. Patricia Highsmith also wrote The Talented Mr. Ripley and all of the Tom Ripley books. She wrote Strangers on a Train. Mm-hmm. This is someone who is steeped in thriller, now writing a love story. It suddenly made so much more sense. Right. It was very... The, the fact that it was so entertaining and such a page turner made so much more sense to me when I found out who Patricia Highsmith oh, was. Oh, she's like a master of plot. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. A master of plot who said, I've never read a good book about lesbians. I am a lesbian. I'm going to write that book. Yeah. And she wrote it and didn't write any more. Right. This is the one. This is it. This and, is the one. And this was also written from personal perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. she was, I didn't know if you were going to talk no. about this. Oh, no, this. go ahead, go ahead. No, but she was working as a temp in 1948 in Bloomingdale's and met a woman and went home that night and basically wrote the outline that night yeah. in two hours yeah. for the whole thing. The characters are based loosely on herself and on women she had a relationship with. Mm-hmm. She didn't end up having a relationship with that woman, but she did have a relationship with a woman who basically lost her daughter because it was found out that she was a lesbian. Right. Or, and was engaging in, re- in a lesbian relationship. Right. And so she took a lot from her own personal life. Therese is absolutely Patricia Highsmith. Yeah, I love that. That's great. That was something I didn't know. That yeah. was something that I found out afterwards. I just want to say another couple of quick things about things I found out. Yeah. Can I say one thing just related to what you just said, yes. though? Because this this kind of plays into what I was Please. going to say, my mm-hmm. last point about the book. Um, it's just like, I feel like we have some narratives in the culture about what it was like to be gay in, you know, an earlier time, like the 40s or the 50s or the 60s. Like um, Call the Midwife is a show I think I've mentioned before on here. And there's a plot line that that two of the nurses fall in love with each other and it has to be this this great secret. But like nobody really, well, I think one person suspects, but nobody really suspects. Like it's not obvious. In this book, and I believe this perspective because it was written by someone who was in that world in that situation having similar experiences sort of everybody knows and is suspicious the whole time like yeah they're not blind like they know that it's a thing and she has a conversation with uh, Therese has a conversation with Richard at one point where she says she asked him like have you ever been in love before no have you ever been in love with a boy no of course not but you've heard of it yeah, I've heard of it. I know I knew of guys that were like quote like that. But why why are you asking? Are you in love with a girl? And she says, "No, no, of course not." But like that- No, of course not. But by the way, I want to go on this road trip with this beautiful woman that I just met. Exactly, exactly. But you know, you understand what I'm saying like they're having a conversation about the concept of homosexuality. It is it is not something that is absent from people's minds or suspicions if they see like people of the same gender getting too close do do you know what I mean yeah but I think we have this idea that like nobody really even knew about it so people weren't really suspicious if you know two women lived together like if you brought it up you were gonna blow someone's mind yeah exactly exactly and and of course I'm not saying that like people weren't persecuted in that time period for being gay because of course they were but like I think we have this feeling that it it was more of a secret than it was does that make sense yes it does okay so that was all i wanted to say please keep going with your yeah no but just to stay on that for a second there's an aspect of it that i had to i I had to think about for a little bit Mm -hmm. i had to think on it for a little bit because after reading it and watching the movie i have been exposed to so much that has been written and said about this book in this movie yeah and a lot of it felt to me to be contradictory. 
So I had to think on it for a little bit. Okay. Kind of wrap my head around it. Because I was hearing things that were saying this was not a message book. Mm -hmm. This wasn't trying to drive home a message. It wasn't trying to show persecution of gays and lesbians Mm -hmm. in the 50s. But then it also shows characters who are kind of scandalized by it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Carol loses her daughter over it. Yep. So I'm kind of sitting there thinking like, well, wait a second. How how are those two things going together? How are people saying this isn't a message when this is happening in it? Mm-hmm. And I really I, I realized that that's because I am so used to the tropes in modern movies. Mm-hmm. The one part of it that never really occurred to me is how did the two main characters actually feel about it? Right, 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 right. Because at no point do either of them, well, let me put let me put that a different way. At no point does Carol ever question who she is. She is super strong in who she is. And Therese questions it. But and then figures it out. And then figures and it is out. And fine with it. Yeah, she doesn't, the book doesn't end with them questioning who they are. No, I mean, there's one point in the book where Therese, I think they're in like a record store or something, and she looks across the room and there are these two women with pants and short hair. Yeah. And who are, who are clearly coded as lesbians. And... Or a lesbian couple. And she has this moment of, I'm not like that. I'm not like them. So I can't do this. Mm -hmm. And then I think she kind of realizes, I can be whoever I want to be, whoever I am, and still be in love with this woman. Like, I don't have to, I don't have to have these signs and symbols to the world to just kind of stand in my truth. True. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of where I, that my thinking had to evolve a little bit. And I wasn't really prepared to read it the way that I ended up reading it. Yeah. So I had to I had to work on that a little bit. Yeah. But I still really like it. Yeah, I love it. It's a great book. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was so 2017. The first book I read in the year the calendar year 2017 was The Handmaid's Tale. I think this was the first or one of the first books I read in 2018. Like the. It's it's better. It's a better start to the year. It's sure. more it's more positive. It's more uplifting. Totally. Uh, a couple other tiny little things that I found out yeah. that I just really really wanted to mention. We talked already about Claire Morgan, which yes, was her pseudonym. What the book was published or under her suitor name. This is probably my favorite part. Do you know about the dedication? No. Open the book up. Okay. Can you read the dedication? To Edna, Jordy, and Jeff. Do you know who they are? No. Who, guess. Who do you think they are? uh her her lovers you think her lovers i don't know her children guess what what they're nobody what they are (laughs) no one completely manufactured uh it turns out in this place the dedication is a red herring much like communism oh boy so that was some stuff i found out the second that i love reference Um, in this podcast in the 90s she was approached by a uh a largely um a publisher of largely lesbian literature Mm mm-hmm who basically said to her, we want to republish The Price of Salt. We will either pay you $5,000 to republish it under your name or $2,000 to republish it under Claire Morgan. She picked the $2,000 <gasps> and had it republished under Claire Morgan. Then later, uh, she did republish it under her own name as Carol. Yeah. The book was republished as Carol years before the movie was made. Got it. So that was something that... Yeah, I, I did I not kind, know that. I assumed that was like a movie tie-in. I kind of assumed that as well. Yeah. Um, there was a movie tie-in version of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they didn't change the name for that. Yeah. They had changed the name prior to that. Yeah. So that's kind of... That's where I stand on the book. That's great. I really liked it. That's awesome, The babe. book The book really spoke to me. I'm glad In a lot of different ways. I, I It spoke to me too. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to talk about the movie and the road to making the movie. But there are some characters from the book that did not make it down that path. Do you have a so not appearing in this film? Because I have one. If if you if you want to just like leave that to me, I actually don't have one. I okay. would like to hear who yours is. Mine is Mrs. Robichek. Yes, that she, weird the yep, weird woman yep. from the beginning of the book. Yeah, just I was because, actually I was actually a little disappointed she wasn't in the movie. Yeah, I was disappointed too because I I would have loved to see. Therese's relationship with someone other than people she's like romantically involved with Mm -hmm. and I understand why Mrs. Robichak did not make it to the screen because that scene is really random and strange and I don't even know that the sort of moral of it would have played and maybe my interpretation of what the moral of it is is not right like maybe so um 
so I, I understand why she didn't make it because it's kind of an odd and random scene, but it is really a weird and interesting interaction that would have been interesting to see maybe as like a deleted scene or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So oh, that's mine. Do you know about the deleted scenes? No. I heard about one. We'll talk about it soon. What's okay. All yep. right. So anyway, this nice book that was written in 1952 that we both really like was made into a movie that was released in 2015. And I believe you did some research on the what it took to get that book from the page to the screen. It took a while. Yeah. So let's talk about it. Let's Go ahead. say that. So I don't really know much prior to 1996. I do know that the rights changed hands in 1996. Mm-hmm. And that's when Phyllis Nagy was brought on okay. as screenwriter. Got it. So she is the screenwriter of the movie. Mm-hmm. She's the sole, she gets sole screenwriter credit. And she's credit. been working on this since 1996? Yes. Wow, that's yeah, wild. The first draft, the, she finished her first draft in 1997. Wow. I think she's been working on it directly longer than anybody involved with the movie. Yeah. So the producer that brought Nagy on was uh, someone named Dorothy Berwin. Uh, she stopped being a direct producer at some point during production. She is, I believe, listed as an executive producer. So she's still involved, but not as heavily involved as she was at the beginning. But she brought Nagy on. Now, do you know about Nagy's relationship with Patricia Highsmith? Nope. They're friends. Oh, good. They became very close. And Patricia Highsmith that. is not with us. Am I correct? She is not with us. Yes. She was at that time. She, did she sur- And she did not survive to see this this 2015 Oscar no, nominated film. No, she did not. No, okay. No. Um... But Nagy was a friend of hers. Mm -hmm. I do think that Phyllis Nagy, I also believe I am pronouncing her name correctly. That sounds right. I think she takes her relationship with Patricia Highsmith very seriously. Mm -hmm. Very seriously. And that led to some very strong opinions by her on how to make this movie. Got it. On how to write this movie. So, for example, one of the things that makes the movie really differ from the book is like I said before, Therese is like 90% of the book. Yeah. And Carol's like a very potent 10%. Yeah. The movie's much more half and half. Mm -hmm. Carol gets a lot more screen time from Therese. And you see a lot of Carol that isn't through Therese's eyes, which you don't really in the book at all. That was a conscious decision Phyllis Nagy made very early on in the writing process. Mm -hmm. So that was something that I did find out. That wasn't someone telling her to do that. That was her decision to do that. Yeah. So over the years, it struggled to find financing. Yes. Let me ask you this. What aspect of the story do you think caused the most issue for them to find financing? Women. I am so happy that you went straight to that. Because part of me was thinking you would say it's about lesbians. Well, it is de facto... By being about lesbians, it does de facto star women. But I am 100% sure it's because there are no parts for men in it. Yep. That 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 is uh, definitely the view yeah. by those involved. Um, the fact that it was, I'm going to say, a quote unquote gay movie, mm-hmm. that wasn't what caused them to lack financing yeah, for I, so long. I 100 believe that. It's about it's the fact because that it's there are about a lot women. Of men gay movies, do yep. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. So it uh, changed hands many times, yep. and many different directors were attached to it. I'm going to go through a quick little list. Of people who were attached. Oh my goodness, there's enough to have a list? Yeah. Wow. There was Hetty McDonald. Okay. It's a British director. Hetty McDonald is responsible for my favorite episode of Doctor Who Ooh. called Blink. Cool. It's the best episode uh, of that show. Kenneth Branagh, I don't know if you've heard of him. Wow. Yep. How, what would he have cast himself as? I think he would have cast himself as Harge. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, Carol's... Husband. Estranged. Estranged? estranged. Am I using that word correctly? Yeah. Well, I guess they're not really estranged because they do still speak to each other. Right. I think of estranged as you don't speak. I guess that makes sense. Her... Soon to be ex. Yes. <laughs> I think he would have cast himself as her soon to be ex. Her husband. I would say... I'm just going to say this right now. Let's... How many male characters of note over the age of 30 are there in this? One. Two. Oh, the detective? The detective. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Two. I, I, the detective is one of my favorite parts. Yeah. Can I just talk about the detective yeah, for a second? Yeah, of course. So when they go on their road trip, they meet a, they meet a guy. Mm-hmm. Therese meets this guy. And he's just this dude. Yeah. He's this normal older guy. Kind of late middle-aged. Yep. We don't really know for sure. As they're on their road trip, they're in a different city in a different hotel. And she recognizes they him. They keep seeing him. They keep seeing him. And it's a really slow burn. And then it turns out, yes, he is a detective. 
he has been recording them in their hotel rooms. Oh, so creepy. And sending the recordings back to New York. And that is now ammo for Which Harge's divorce was against a her. a more difficult business in 1952 than it is now. Oh, yes. Sending, making recordings and sending them. Oh, I have a lot of respect for him. He's very resourceful. Yeah. No, he's good at his job, clearly. Super, super good at his job. Yeah. Also terrible. Yes, also the worst. <laughs> um, part of the patriarchy. Yeah, of course. Am I? I don't know if I'm overstepping by saying no, that. No, you're not. But I think Kenneth Branagh would have played Harge. I don't think he would have played the detective. You don't think he would have played Carol? <laughs> Maybe in the version where they changed Carol to Carl. That would have been amazing. No, that would have been bad. What are you talking about? I, you know what? I think we should have a meeting about it. Let's, let's, let's see if we can have a meeting Do about that. Do you think that. he would have had his mustaches? <laughs> We haven't even released that episode yet. We will have by the time this one comes out. Oh, shit. Yeah. I forgot how time works. This is great. I'm looking great. So another person that was attached to this was Kimberly Pierce. Okay. Who directed Boys Don't Cry. Okay. So I think it makes sense that this person was something, someone they looked at. Mm -hmm. I'm maybe glad they didn't go with her. Sure. I don't know how you feel about that. I don't know. Is... Have you ever seen Boys Don't Cry? Yeah. Okay. Is, are you, is it not good? Have you seen it? Yeah, I have seen it, but I'm asking, is it like known to not be good? I don't... I, no, I think it's known... I don't know anything about it in terms of movie making. I think it's known to be good. Yeah. However, if the goal of your movie is to not make this a message movie... Oh, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're kind of uh, doing yourself a disservice by hiring Kimberly Pierce. Yes, that's fair. Not because Kimberly Pierce wouldn't have done a great job, just because, because I Because it would have been Carol from the director of Boys Don't Cry. Exactly. That would have been the message. And then there's one more person they did look at. Yeah. Another man, Stephen Frears, who directed oh, The Queen. Yes. And High Fidelity. Yes. Father of Will Frears, also yeah. a director. Uh-huh. Yes. I think he would have been very good. I'm sure. I like his movies. Yeah. But anyway, they went with Todd Haynes. I'm glad they... Yeah. 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 So a lot of different things happened. Um, there was... It was going to get made in like 2013... Um, it was going to be Kate Blanchett. She mm -hmm. got attached several years ago. And Mia Vazakovska. Okay. She was going to be Therese. Uh, enough time passed before they could get it made that Mia Vazakovska had to drop out. Yeah. And then Todd Haynes was brought on. And very quickly, like apparently he agreed to do it within two days. And Todd Haynes is like known as that quote unquote like women's director, right? He direct He's directed all these movies about like women in the 50s. Well, one. Oh, I thought he had done a whole bunch. No, just the one. Just the one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What was it called? I don't know. Julianne Moore was in it. Shit. She was in love with that guy. Far from heaven. You know, the one where Julianne Moore is in love with the guy that does the State Farm commercials. That is the best way I've ever heard anybody describe Dennis Haysbert. Yes, Far From Heaven. <laughs> yes. He directed Far From Heaven. Or is it Allstate? Uh, it doesn't matter. No, Farmers. No, Shit. it's not Farmers because Farmers is the other guy. <laughs> Farmers is the guy we from are Whiplash. Farmers. Bum, 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 bum. We're we going to get have... sued for copyright infringement on that. I don't think Farmers is going to care about free advertising. We do not use Farmers. I'll no. put that out there. No, we don't. Uh, yes, that is the one where Julianne Moore falls in love with Dennis Haysbert <laughs> because her marriage with Dennis Quaid is, is bad because bad he's gay. Oh, right. I forgot about the gay part. So yes. he's, this is his second 1950s gay ladies movies. Gay persons gay movie. Gay persons. Julianne Moore's not gay. No, but Dennis Quaid is. she is a lady in it. Right. Anyway. <laughs> this is going so well. I've never seen Far From Heaven. Have you seen it? Yes. Oh, was it good? It's okay. Okay. Cool. It's all right. But yeah, I think that yeah, from everything I've heard, he really went at this a different way. Yeah. Like, I don't think he thought of it in his head as, oh, this is the second in my 1950s Haven't We trilogy. Come So Far trilogy. <laughs> I don't think that's how he looked at it. Because there was a race aspect to the far, to Far From Heaven yeah. as well. But Todd Haynes also did uh, I'm Not There, which was the Bob Dylan. Right. I'm going to say quote unquote biopic. Right. Starring Kate Blanchett, among many others. Right. The one where I said I wish more people did casting that was totally irrelevant to sex and gender. Like that Bob Dylan movie. And you were like, I didn't like that movie. Well, that's beside the point for now. Yes. That's beside the point. He also did Velvet Goldmine, which I do ah, like very much. Yes. I've yes. always liked Velvet Goldmine. So suffice it to say that Todd Haynes is one that has done a number of movies in relationship to gender and sexuality. Yes. It's someone who I think would take it very seriously. Yes. Uh, which I think he did. Yeah. I absolutely think he did. So then they brought Todd Haynes on and everything came together very, very quickly. And that led to the movie that we have. Mm -hmm. Now... I do think someone else deserves credit for bringing this really important tale of uh, 
alternative sexuality and women Mm -hmm. to the big screen. Harvey Weinstein. Harvey Weinstein. (laughs) A a champion of women in film. Oh, God. Uh, It really is a bummer. He probably sees himself as a champion of women in film. That's the disgusting part. Well, that's why he deserves to touch all of them. Touch and look at. Uh, it's such a bummer. I just it's, threw up on the dog. It, I would say I, I want to see a list of every movie that his name is attached to now in retrospect. This might be the biggest bummer. Um, I saw somebody, this was absolutely on Autostraddle, I believe. They did an alignment chart for the movie Carol, you know, like like um, lawful good, lawful neutral, sure. et cetera, et cetera. And everyone was a different face. But by the time it got to chaotic evil, it was just a screenshot of the first frame of the movie that just says the Weinstein company. That's fair. That's <laughs> super great. fair. So that's a that's a bummer. Yeah. That's a bummer that that we know. We're going to f- try to find that and put it in the show notes, that alignment chart. It's very good. Oh, I'll definitely try to find that. Yeah. So that brings us to the movie. Yes. Now, I just want to get, there's a segment I'd like to get out of the way. Great. Right here at the beginning Let's as we talk it. about this. Go for it. Hey, sweetie. Yeah. How do you feel about the female part? Do you think the female part's a little underwritten? No. It's great. Do you want to just continue or do you have more to say on that? The female part's not underwritten. That's why people like this movie. Because there's female characters that are fully realized. Full stop. Done. Well, this is the most... That that bra- That's <laughs> we, the shortest... Uh, the shortest the female part is a little underwritten we've ever done. Well, because it's not. I mean, sometimes it's legitimate yeah. to say it's not. Mm-hmm. But that, we're always going to do it. Of course we are. We're always going to acknowledge Except it. Except for the times that we forget. Yeah. So let's talk about this movie a little bit. Yeah. I had never seen it before. Right. You had, though. Yes. How do you feel about this movie? I love it. Yeah? I love it. What do you love about it? Um, I love... I just... Hmm. I like the... As a movie, mm-hmm. I like the way that it's shot. I like that it has this sort of, like, dreamy, grainy feel, like it's me- like it's memory. Yeah. Um, I love the way he uses color and light to kind of make us feel a certain way about different locations. Um, the department store is really yellow. Like, it's really, like, washed out and yellow. And yeah. when they're on the road, it's really blue um, and gray. There's, there's all these different... He uses color really well. He uses... There's all these little details that are just so fascinating that make you want to watch it over and over and over again. Just little things like how they're sitting in the living room and Carol takes off her shoes and but she's still in her like beautiful dress and then Hard shows up and she's like trying to put her shoes on really really quickly um or like just people's faces in the background like what they're thinking I think the costumes are amazing and tell so much about the characters and the way that they change the way that Therese is dressed at the end versus the beginning of the movie um is really was really interesting I, I read something that said um at the end of the movie, she's uh, Therese, who's played by Rooney Mara, is dressed. She's like a little bit more sophisticated. And Carol actually, they're meeting for like a drink. And Carol actually says to her, like, you look wonderful. Like, you really blossomed. And she's wearing these pearl earrings. And the the image on the movie poster is the, sort of her in profile. And she's wearing those earrings. And I heard that Rooney Mara was actually kind of upset because she was like, that's just the end. You're showing her at the end. You should be showing her at the beginning yeah. on the movie poster. But I think... Both of the actresses. Um, Can I say one quick thing, though? Yeah. Just just to build off what you were just saying, Todd Haynes is someone who is, I think, more than anything, intentional. Yes. Every single frame of this movie feels like it was on purpose. Yes. And I really, that's something I really appreciate. This, is, this movie was not a movie made by people who didn't give a shit. No. There's a lot of give a shit up on the screen. Yes. About everything. You know, you talk about the way it's shot. It's shot on 16 millimeter. I don't know which, what that means. So it's shot on a smaller frame of film. Okay. So basically, the larger the frame of film, the less grain there is. Because mm-hmm. you can't really see the grain. Right, right, The grain's right. much smaller. So on a smaller frame of film, I'm making hand gestures as we're doing this right now, just <laughs> so everybody knows. I'll take a knows. picture of you so we can put it in the show notes. So It was this big. <laughs> So on a smaller grain of film, a smaller uh, frame of film, you're going to see way more grain. Right. That makes sense. So like movies that I can think of, a lot of like older documentaries were shot on 16 millimeter. Uh, Moonrise Kingdom that came out a few years ago. Wes Anderson shot that on 16 millimeter because he wanted it to have that kind of dreamy look. Yep. 
And this is a movie that does that. Yeah. Which I think surprised a lot of people because I think a lot of people were expecting Far From Heaven Part 2. Yeah. And Far From Heaven is like 35 millimeter Technicolor. Like crisp and clear. Cause, crisp, Well, because he was doing something, he was doing something different. Like yeah. that was different. And this, I, he didn't want that at all. And I don't think he did 16 millimeter because he shot Far From Heaven in 35. No, he just... He just thought that's what this needed. He, yeah, it's the right choice for the film. I just, I respect so much how intentional he is as a director. Yeah. And I think, I'm I'm really happy for people that love this book, that they got a movie made by someone who gives a, so much of a shit because about making about a good movie. How, think about how exploitative this could have been. Yes. With the wrong director and the wrong actors and the wrong people. Like, it could have been awful. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just great that the, the treatment of the movie was done by people that really cared about bringing this movie to the screen. Um, I mean, in terms of what the movie represents and cause we've talked about the plot, like it's, it's pretty straightforward. They made some changes from the book and we talked about some of them. One of them is that the, um, the road trip is, is pretty condensed. Yeah. Um, there the are a lot of thing is very condensed. The whole thing is very condensed. There's a lot of stuff that they cut. The, um, the stuff with the detective is very condensed in the book. It really kind of goes on for much longer and they have this kind of weird encounter with him, like on the side of the road in the movie, Carol actually like threatens him with a gun in the, Carol seems Carol is like a, a, more unstable. I think in the movie, or at least more quickly made to be unstable. Yeah. Um, because she has this gun that Therese finds in her luggage, and Therese kind of like asks her about it in a really roundabout way. She's like, "Do you feel safe? Are you okay?" And then, you know, ten minutes later, she's threatening the detective with with this gun. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think her instability makes a lot of sense, knowing the changes that Phyllis Nagy made. Because she really decided, I'm not going to make this as subjective as the as it was in the book. Yeah. Carol is going to be a character in this movie. She's not going to be just how Therese sees her. Yeah. And it makes a lot more sense that she's less, that she's more stable in the book because she is what Therese sees. Right. Which is a very stable adult. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, in terms of like the dialogue, I love the, there's a lot of stuff that's pulled straight from the book when Carol says... Therese she says you're a strange girl flung out of space like that's straight from the book yeah it's just a, such an amazing line and I love that the screenwriter kept it in mm-hmm. um and that line about how we're not we're not cru- you were never cruel and how you know we're not we're not this type of person mm-hmm. that when Carol's talking to her husband um it's just it, it's very they, they feel like very real people in kind of heightened circumstances, um, but just this, the the relationship between the two women is really real. Um, it's really, I think, just really nice to see because there's a lot going on in their lives, but they're never really angry at each other. Like sometimes they are a little bit, but just their their relationship. It's not like a modern relationship because they don't communicate like. Like you and I do, for example. Like they don't have long conversations about their this feelings. How, this is how I feel. This is how you I have feel. Made through being very quiet right now. You yep. have made me feel this way. It is important that I say this. And I acknowledge how you are feeling. And yep. I just want to let you know how the mm-hmm. thing that you said made me feel. And mm-hmm. I understand that you had a right to say it. But that is that is how it made me feel. And I just want you to know. Like that's how we communicate. And scene. And scene. Um, that is not how they communicate. It's It's a little bit. But but it's also like, I don't know. I I think it's really interesting because I don't expect two people in 1952, whatever their gender, to have a 2018 relationship as far as level of communication goes. Because people can only people can only do what is modeled for them. You know what I mean? Yeah. So well, th- there's I, can I can I say one thing that I think goes along with of that? Of course you can. So you were talking before about the conversation that Therese has with Richard. Yeah. Where Richard says, you know, women like that. Yeah. At no point is the word lesbian used in the book. No. Carol never describes herself that way. Never. And that to me feels like a very 1950s totally, choice. Totally, totally, totally. But 
she also isn't a character who loathes herself because she is a lesbian. She's also... She just doesn't say the word because it's a different time and the vernacular was different and the way we talk about those kind of things was, was a bit different. Totally. And, and just as a little plug to bisexual visibility, she's also not necessarily a lesbian. That's true. She is a woman that... She is a, she is a woman. Yes, she, she is. She is a woman. She is more than one woman. She is a woman who has had relationships with both women and men. Yes. Um, as is Therese. Mm-hmm. Now, how they would classify themselves either in 1952 or in 2018, we cannot say. Um, but I just wanted to put that that little plug in there. Fair. Yeah, it yeah. is fair. Very mm-hmm. fair. So you had told me before that you had a runner-up for Sir Not Appearing in this film. I do. Who's that? Carrie Brownstein. So is this a uh, lady not appearing in this book? The, uh, Well, no. Lady not appearing in this film who is in the book. Okay. Um, But I'm just going to say Carrie Brownstein because I love Carrie Brownstein. Okay. Um, I think she's pretty. But she's in the movie. For a very short period of time. I should let you say this. Why don't you just... I'm going to shut up over here for a second. Go ahead, sweetie. Thank you. So in the book, here's how the book ends. They're on this road trip. Carol flies back to New York because she has gotten word that if she does not immediately come back and try to work things out with Harge, he will take her daughter away and she will never see her again. Mm -hmm. And Abby, who is Carol's friend, then quote unquote friend, then friend again, who is Sarah Paulson in the movie flies out to drive Therese home in Carol's car. And they don't see each other for a long time, months and months and months. Therese, in the meantime, has gotten a job, and she's doing pretty well. She's not with Richard. And Carol, we learn, has been going through sort of custody battles and stuff with uh, Harge. And Carol communicates with Therese and says, come meet me. And they, they meet for a drink. And Carol says to her, I'm divorced He's got my daughter, and that's how it is. I have a new apartment, and I have a job, and I would like you to come live with me. And Therese says, no. No, I, I don't think I don't think so. It, it takes her by great surprise. She, it's not what she's expecting. And she goes off to this party that she had prearranged to go to. And, while she, and at the party, she meets an actress there's the party is for is for like for a play i think that she's been working on or that's connected with something that she's been working on yeah um and she meets this actress who is into her um and wants to kiss her face and in the movie that part is just is carrie brownstein who's just like another girl at a party like a really attractive girl at a party and therese i think realizes other people will want me Carol was not my only shot at this, but the person I want is Carol. That's what I, that's my reading of it, Mm -hmm. that it takes someone else hitting on her to realize I have other options. This isn't my only option, but this is, I, I now realize this is what I want. And she goes back to Carol and they see each other across a crowded room. And the implication is that they're going to be together. And that's the end of both book and movie. Yeah. But the part that Carrie Brownstein plays is very cut down. She only has like a couple of lines. And in the book, it's a much more important character. Yeah. And she has a name and a whole scene. And I really wish that Carrie, I had gotten to see Carrie Brownstein play that character. That would have been really cool. Yeah. I so think that's that, my sir not appearing in this film. I think that's indicative of a lot of the changes made between the book and the movie. The movie is kind of ruthless in how much it cuts. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. It cuts so much. It cuts characters. It cuts lines. It cuts time. It condenses everything. I feel like maybe a little too much. That's fair. But but not not in a crazy way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's very clear that it does that. And that happens a lot. So I'd like to... I, I want to talk just a little bit more about some of the things that happen as a result of making what I think is the biggest change between the book and the movie. Go ahead, please. Which is about perspective. Yes, So Therese, I do not think she is the main character of this movie. She's definitely not. She and Carol are co-main characters. They're co. It's a co. It's a co-lead. Yeah. It's about both of them. Yes. Whereas in the book, it is very much Therese's story. Yes. Everything that I found out is that this was super intentional. This was something that Phyllis Nagy did as a result of her relationship with Patricia Highsmith. Mm -hmm. 
knowing so much about how much Patricia Highsmith put herself into this story, yep. it sounded like Highsmith had reservations about doing it the way that it was written. Mm-hmm. And Nagy had those same reservations and made the decision very early on, this is going to be about both of them. I made a note when we were watching it, I do not think there is a scene in this movie that is explicitly from Therese and only Therese's perspective until a half an hour in. Mm, interesting. It takes that long. Whereas what the... scene would you say that is? Did you did you make a note of what that is? Because I think it's the scene in the in the toy store when no. she sees Carol for the first time. No, I in fact I, the way I read that is that that's them seeing each other. Yeah, I think they have equal footing in that scene. That's fair. Yeah, I, I do not see Carol as object, and I do I don't see her as subject. Yeah. in that one. Um, no, it's the scene when they're driving out to Carol's house for the first time. Mm-hmm. So they've had their glove lunch. Oh, yes, the glove lunch. And Carol has invited her, has invited Therese to her house. Yes. And they're driving out. And that whole scene plays out from Therese's perspective. Yes. That's that's a half an hour in. And that's the first time we get that. Yeah. And and also in the movie, um, insta- I don't think we mentioned this, instead of being a set designer, Therese is a photographer. Mm-hmm. So we see her looking at Carol in order to sort of take photographs yeah. of her do you know why she's a photographer in the movie i mean my assumption is that it's easier for an audience to understand what a photographer is than a theater set designer but that, maybe there was a more specific reason that was my assumption too Oh, nope okay so phyllis nagy made her a photographer because of patricia highsmith okay because let me ask you this when you're a set designer mm-hmm. can you ever design a set about a person no. That's not really a thing it's in set really design. Thing. When you're a writer, can you write can you get better at writing about people? Yes. And learning about the human learning about human nature. Yes. And how people relate to each other. Yes. As a photographer, can you start being better at observing people? Yes. She wanted to have Therese in the movie go on the same journey that Patricia Highsmith did as an author. That's really sweet. I love that. She makes her a photographer. And in the movie, she even says that she's not as comfortable taking pictures of people. And over the course of the movie. She takes like beautiful pictures of Carol. Exactly. I I like that. I don't know how you feel about it, but I like it. I was, until I found that out, I was again it. Um, (laughs) Now you're for it? Now I'm for it. Uh, I think that's very thoughtful. Yes. So that was, that was something that I noticed. Yeah. I will also say as far as the casting. Oh, let's talk about the cast. Yeah. Yes. So we have Kate Blanchett. Famously pretty Kate Blanchett. Famously pretty woman Kate Blanchett. Um, here's here's my only problem with Kate Blanchett because yes. I think her performance is magnificent. Yeah. And I don't want to take anything away from that. Mm-hmm. I don't know her age, and of course Kate Blanchett is ageless. I have it. What was her age? Tell me again, what's what's Carol's age in the book? Thirty or thirty two. Okay, she's forty six. Okay. Her age is too old. Yep. Kate Blanchett is beautiful and yeah. magnetic She's and famously attractive. Pretty. You've said that several times. Yeah. I had no problem believing that Rooney Mara would be attracted to Kate Blanchett. That is not the issue. I, this is not an old women are icky issue whatsoever. No. Because she's beautiful and extremely sexy in this movie. Mm-hmm. But I, I did have a little bit of a problem believing her as the mother of a six-year-old. Yeah. And I did have a little bit of a problem believing her as being as fragile as she is supposed to be mm-hmm. because she's just, because she's a, because she's older, she just seems a little bit more um, on top of her shit. And... I just feel like a younger person yet still older than Therese because Therese is only supposed to be 19. Yeah. Do you know know, how old Rooney Mara is? I think she was probably like at least 28 or 30. 30. Yeah. Um, So Rooney Mara is the age that Carol is supposed to be. And Therese is only supposed to be 19. Can I say one other thing that kind of goes along with this? Yes. About Kate Blanchett in the role. This is something where... If they thought about this, I'm sure they made the decision that it didn't matter as much as having Kate Blanchett in the role. Mm -hmm. And also, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't think of this. Yes. There's an aspect of the way that Kate Blanchett plays the character that I don't think is in keeping 100% with the idea behind the script, Mm -hmm. which is 
we're going to take Carol and change her from an object in the eyes of Therese yep. into a fully fledged character. Yeah. Because, and I don't know how you, what you think of this, I do think Kate Blanchett plays the character as very aloof and mysterious. Yes, she definitely does. Extremely. Which I think kind of goes against the idea that you're going to make her more of an accessible character. Mm -hmm. And you're going to show more of what's actually happening in her head. Yeah. Because we don't get that at all. I think she's playing Carol from the book. She's just in way more scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess all I'm saying is that, like, Carol is kind of a mess and Kate Blanchett is really self-assured. Yeah. In a great and very attractive well, way there's that one great scene between her and harge yeah where she pushes him down yes they have a fight yeah yeah well he's like drunk yeah yeah he's drunk he's taking her daughter yeah and they have a fight that's one scene where she does not seem like she has her shit together yeah. i don't mean she seems yeah no 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 i get it crazy she doesn't she just does not seem like she's on top of what's going on in her life. Yeah, and and it's funny because the age difference between Rooney Mara and Kate Blanchett is actually greater than the age difference between uh, Carol and Therese. Carol and Therese, which is which is fine and great. Um, and and honestly, like I don't know the I don't know if you know this or not. Age gap relationships are a very big thing in the lesbian community. Like, oh no, that's something I'm aware. That's of. very common. Yeah. Um, speaking of speaking of Sarah Paulson right uh who is adorable and her 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 love is Holland Taylor who is just wonderful I've never seen Sarah Paulson be anything less than great in anything she's in have I, you no no she's great she's great mm -hmm. she's great um and her girlfriend is Holland Taylor yep um who is in her 70s which is it's just adorable they're they're super in love they're it's very sweet it's really cute so yeah I I would it's hard for me to say I wish they had cast these characters a little younger because I love Kate Blanchett in this role. Well, like I was saying, if they thought about that... They clearly didn't care. I'm sure they said, no, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I guess we could make the case we should cast a younger... But we have Kate Blanchett. She wants to do this. Yeah. And she's going to be great. And low, She was great. Low and she was. And she was great. And she's she's extremely sexy. Yeah. Like, that. I am not... I, I, I guess, I guess I don't know. I guess in the book, and maybe it's right now that I think about it. Maybe it's right because it, it is really supposed to be an older woman, and I don't know that we're going to look at a thirty-year-old and go, "Oh, she's an older woman." Do you know what I mean? Maybe that's an issue of time. Yeah, because someone who's thirty now is not at a point in their life that someone in their thirties in the fifties would have been. It, exactly. I exactly. just threw out a bunch of numbers, but I think it all tracks. No, it tracks. It definitely tracks. And 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 something about like the fifties costumes ages people yeah. a lot. But I I I almost think I'm kind of going back on what I said before because now I'm kind of picturing what that would have looked like. I think if they had cast a thirty year old. That person would be would look too young, and we'd be seeing them as someone who's thirty now. Yeah, like I'm almost thirty four. Yeah, and Carol seems like my mom. Right, but I'm thirty five, 30. and I do not have my shit together. Yeah, at all. Yeah, exactly. No one I know my age has their shit together. No one, not one person. A couple of them. A couple of them. Yeah, yeah. But they're weird. They all have kids. I don't want to see a movie about. I them. think I think it's I think the difference is whether or not you have kids. Right. Yeah. I I agree with that. Yeah. I agree with that, and it is. When it comes to the small details, that's a quibble. Yeah. But I get it. It certainly doesn't have the weight that some of my other age quibbles in previous episodes have mm. had. And in fact, I think I've convinced myself that it's important that she is a little bit older than she yeah. is in the book. Because for a modern audience. Exactly. Yeah. So you love this movie. I do. And I could see that when we were watching it. Yeah. I could see that this was something that was really important. And I have learned so much more about how important this is to audiences. Yes. Do you want to talk about some things you've learned? I mean, no, just what we already said. Yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't realize what this represented to people. Right. I didn't realize, I didn't know much about like how it was not nominated for Best Picture mm -hmm. at the Academy Awards that year. Oh, it was a slight. Uh, and a lot of people see it that way. Mm -hmm. And I can see how personally some people take that. Mm-hmm. And I, I have to allow them that. Mm -hmm. I have to allow them that. Because yes. this is more important to... There, There is a group of people that this movie is more important to than it is to me. Yes. And I have to accept and respect that. Yes. We definitely do. I feel... I sense a but. I sense a but coming. Jeremy, I have a question for you. Yes? Did you like this movie? Can I take the fifth? 
No. I did not like this movie. <gasps> I've... Uh, I want to be... This is one of the reasons why I was so scared to do this episode <laughs> is because... Can you can you describe to our listeners what it was like watching this movie with me? You would say something critical. Yeah. And I got would get mad. Yep. <laughs> that happened a couple of times. I was so mad watching this movie. <laughs> I kept a lot of it in because I knew how much it meant to you and how much you loved it. Yes. And very quickly I realized that I was hurting you. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I talked about something that was bad, we had a fight about this. We didn't we didn't not a fight. We had words about this. We had some words. Some words were spoken. Yeah. It was not... Because I said, you're making it not fun for me to watch this movie. And I felt awful about that. Rightfully so. I felt really awful. I did not enjoy this movie. Now, everything I have said up to this point... So everyone's just turned off their podcasts and thrown their phones out the window and you've just alienated our entire demographic. Yeah, but then it wouldn't matter because they're not hearing any of what I'm saying. Okay. But I'm going to continue. Please do. Everything I have said up to this point about what I respect of this movie and how I respect the people who made it is true. Okay. There's so much in this movie that I think is great and wonderful. I did not like it. I really kind of was mad a lot of the times that we were watching it. And it all goes back to something I said before. Yeah. I have never read a book that so accurately captured falling in love with someone from a subjective viewpoint as this book did Mm -hmm. and i was really happy that it was people experiencing that who weren't me Mm -hmm. i was identifying with people who aren't me going through something that i completely understand yeah this is such a subjective book it's all from teresa's perspective i as a as someone who enjoyed the book because i read it before we watched the movie Watched the movie as a fan of the book. Yep. And for me as a fan and what makes me a fan, it did not do a good job of capturing. I see. Because Phyllis Nagy made the specific decision to not make the movie from Teresa's perspective, but to make it from her perspective and Carol's perspective. Got it. And I did not appreciate that because I loved the book for how subjective it was. Yep. I really, I always really respond to subjectivity. Mm -hmm. I think subjectivity is one of the most interesting things to look at in a story, in fiction, Mm -hmm. because everything is subjective, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was super mad (laughs) the the whole time when we were watching it. Every time we got a scene that was just Carol and Therese wasn't there, I was mad. You were mad. I was mad that the movie doesn't start out the way the book starts out with Mrs. uh, Mrs. Robichek. Yeah. I real I was mad that the scene between Therese when she first meets Carol is from both of their perspectives. Mm-hmm. Not because I want Carol to become an object, but because Carol was an object. Yeah. And Therese's experience of knowing Carol was she started as an object and then she became a person. Mm-hmm. As she learned more about who Carol was by the end, and it wasn't until she got to know Carol as a person that she was ready to say, no, this is who I love. Yeah. She was infatuated with her, Mm -hmm. but she didn't love her. She didn't have like the words to talk about it. This wasn't a story about someone who fell in love with someone. This is a story about someone who is actively falling in love with someone. Yes. And I really responded to that. And I think this movie did not do that at all. And I was super mad because it didn't do it on purpose. It so clearly didn't do it on purpose. It wasn't an accident that that happened. I can't just write it off and say, oh, well, they just, they screwed up and they they messed up that part. Like, no, they purposefully made something that intentionally did the thing that I didn't want it to do. Well. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Now that we know what a man thinks about Carol. No, you're, va- you're. That is super unfair. Your viewpoint is absolutely valid. That's so fucked up and that I you just did that. Respect you, you knew going into it how scared I was of saying how I felt about this movie and you just pulled that? Wow. No, no, uh, no, that was a joke. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm scared right now. <laughs> I'm I, trying to, I'm saying something that makes me nervous. I respect your feelings and opinion. Uh-huh. And I love that you loved this book enough to be passionate about the way that it was translated into film. Mm-hmm. I think that's wonderful. Yep. So there we are. Mm-hmm. And I have, I have evidence as well. So 
Uh, here, <laughs> Exhibit A. Here I have. So this is Nagy talking about the uh, the way that she wrote it. Um, Nagy, this is from the uh, from the Wiki from the Wikipedia. The Wicca? Uh, Wikipedia. Okay. Uh, Nagy was initially apprehensive about the narrative structure, considering quote, "There's no character of Carol. She's a ghost, appropriately as she should be in the novel." Adding that she was quote overwhelmed by the task of trying to come up with the visual equivalent for it structurally. She decided to split the point of view and shift perspectives from Therese to Carol as, quote, the point of view is always with the more vulnerable party. So she makes the decision to not make it from Therese's perspective. Right. Then Todd Haynes was talking about it, specifically talking about why the movie is called Carol. Yeah. He said it's because the novel is, quote, locked into the subjectivity of the younger woman, and Carol is, quote, really the object of desire of the story. Just like what you said. Exactly. Except you liked that. That's what I like about it. So Todd Haynes recognized that, but I don't think the script actually backs up what he was saying. Yeah. Because I don't think, yeah, Carol is still the object of Therese's desire, Mm -hmm. but Therese is just as much an object of Carol's desire. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's not the way the book is structured. I think that's really fair. I think that's a really fair criticism. I appreciate that. You have backed up your point (laughs) with evidence. (laughs) I don't think... Hang on. I want to find something really quickly. Mr. Gambini? Yes, sir. That is a lucid, intelligent, well-thought-out objection. Thank you, Your Honor. Overruled. Is that what you're saying right now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And you know what? At least I was able to say my piece. I felt I feel heard. <laughs> oh, good. I feel respected. Good. Um, I feel that I have been able to uh, defend myself. Yes. In this area. Yes. And luckily, nobody knows where we live. Nope. <laughs> Great. I really respect what this movie means to people. Yeah. And and babe, I mean, here's the deal. You your quibble is with the storytelling. Yes. You're not saying I didn't like this movie because women kissing with tongues is icky. Oh, well, now you're on the subject. No, it's <laughs> yeah, no, clearly that's not a problem. <laughs> so I think you're on pretty solid, solid footing yeah. here. I'm happy that I'm not a monster. That, no, that you're makes not a me monster. happy. You're I just don't want to be a Richard. No. I really don't want to be a Richard. No, you're not a Richard. He's the worst. I know. He's the worst. He is the worst. So I I don't really have anything else to say about no, this to you. No, but I want to talk about where this falls on our quadrant. Because oh, yes. I feel like this is going to be a little bit disputed, maybe. Because, mm-hmm. so we've only got the one thing. Yep. The one movie. And from everything you've said, you have provided textual evidence that the people who made this movie really cared about this movie. Absolutely. So I think it's way off on that end of the spectrum. Clearly. But like, I think we differ on whether they were successful. Well, I've had to do a lot of thinking on this. Some soul searching? I really have had to. Did you pray on it? I think it was successful. Yay! I don't think this is a thing where I'm going to say it was unsuccessful and you're going to say it was successful. It is absolutely successful. It is absolutely something I didn't like. Yeah. But I can also appreciate that it was successful. But the reason you didn't like it was subjective. The reason you didn't like it was because you responded to a particular element of the storytelling. Yeah. That they didn't tell the story in the way that you responded to in the book. Right. Which was a choice that they made. Mm -hmm. And I think we could argue about whether or not it was valid. But it wasn't because they did bad. It was because they made a different choice. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if I had them in front of me right now, I would tell. I would give them a piece of my mind. And also tell them they made a very beautiful movie. And I would ask what Kate Blanchett is like in person. I think she's lovely. That's everything I've heard is that she seems really cool. She seems like a delight. She seems real cool. Yeah. Also, before we move on, there is one thing I said I was going to talk about a little while ago, which was scenes that were shot and then cut from the movie. Oh. Okay. So there is a scene that exists, apparently. I've only heard about it. <laughs> You've I've heard o- tell. I've heard hell. I've heard about it anecdotally, but this scene does not, as, as far as I know, it doesn't exist anywhere. Yeah. I looked for it. I didn't look that hard, but like I looked for it and couldn't find it. Okay. It has to do with Therese's relationship with Richard. Oh, no. So you were talking before about how in the book, explicitly, they have sex. Yes. And in the... And in the movie, explicitly, they don't. She says, we've never slept together. Yeah, they've never had intercourse. Oh, God. Yeah, there's a there's an HJ scene oh. that they shot. Can I give my response to that? Yes. Huh. Yeah, and apparently, what do you think a reason would be that they wouldn't put it in the movie? Grossness. Nope. G- gross. 
Would you? So again, this is all anecdotal. Yeah. Do you, would you think that maybe the realism? What do you mean? Of what are you trying to say? What's the, what's the thing that happens at the end of an HJ? Um, there's a- apparently it didn't look real enough, and so they cut it. What did they use? A squirt bottle? I have no idea. Again, never seen it, but apparently they did shoot that scene between Rooney Mara and uh, and the actor who plays Richard, and then it did not make it into the movie. Phyllis Nagy wrote that. Describe my face right now. It is a face of abject horror. <laughs> so I just wanted you to know about that. I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight. Thank I, you for that. You're welcome. All right, moving on. I think that does it for Carol. Yeah. I, I was really nervous going in, but I thought it went well. Yeah, how do you feel? I feel really good. Do you feel like you got something off your chest? I feel good. Do you feel okay with it? I feel great. Great. I, I love you. Fan- that's awesome. Do you still love me? Yes. Fantastic. Hooray. Because when we were watching it and we fought, I didn't know how this was going to go. Oh, God. But that does it for The Price of Salt slash Carol. That's right. By Patricia Highsmith. Mm-hmm. So that brings us to the end of another episode of Adapter Parish. We are on the web at adapterparishcast.com. The show's also on Twitter and Instagram at AdaptCast. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. Now, if you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Uh, If you have someone you know who thinks about adaptations of works they love, maybe, let's say, let's say too much, this might be the show for them. So let them know. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice, like Apple Podcasts or Overcast, would be greatly appreciated. And that brings us to the end. I'm Jeremy Latour. I'm Arielle Lipshaw. And join us in a toast to President McKinley. To President McKinley. Bye, everybody. Bye. Now, just before we move on, was there anything else about, like, the character of Carol that you wanted to say? Um, I will say that Carol's... Like, anything major, like, major about who she is as a person. Yeah, it's very important. Um, okay. In the movie, she takes a martini. Okay. Which is incorrect. Oh. Her drink of choice in the book is an old-fashioned without sugar. That's what she orders. An old-fashioned without sugar is just bourbon. So <laughs> she is my... Bourbon, just bourbon with orange. She is my kind of a girl. Uh, and we'll just leave it at that. <laughs>